it's got to show. Okay. All right. So uh, I stopped here yesterday, uh, and I was I will do a recap of the last slide where uh, I was showing you a movie, and that it was supposed to be a movie of a particle, which is being drifted by a sonar As I said, the, the particle is small, but not that small because it's bigger than the molecules of the environment. And uh, because of the interaction of this colloid or particle with the molecules in the environment, this particle sometimes works backwards. Backwards mean against the stream. So there's a field that is pushing the particle. Sometimes there are rare events in which uh, the particle moves against the average tendency. And this as I explained yesterday, it happens also in, in molecular motors or small biological machines, which is the, the image that supposedly is going to appear on the right. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I have some issues with the recording and with the presentation. And let's be patient. So, all right, I see it in my screen. No, you don't see. Okay. Okay, I'm really sorry. It's totally out of my control. Ah, yes. Okay, so you see here, uh, I was showing you here an example of an experimental trace of a molecular motor that um, sometimes moves against the, the chemical, uh, the drift induced by the chemical reactions. Okay. So, Today, um, I will try to go one step further and introduce you to minimal models of um, uh, used in biophysics. I will be very descriptive. I won't give many equations, but at least I will give you references and, and where can you find um, more information about this topic on molecular motors and beyond. Because just keep in mind what I said yesterday, biophysics is a very broad field. and There are many uh, systems that are studied in this discipline. Molecular motors are just okay, a very <laughs> small part of uh, this big field. So, uh, okay, just as a, if you want uh, more details, I have a full course in YouTube. You can search it like this, QLS Bio, where I give a lot of details and models and exactly solvable models. I solve analytically many models of biophysics. You can find the, the lectures online for free in YouTube. This is part of the ICTP. Uh, diploma program. So most of the things I'm going to tell you come from this course, which you can find online. Um, and here are some classic references of uh, biophysics and also related uh, topics. For example, the ones is, uh, I can share with you later the, the names of these books. The ones that show here in the bottom are the ones I follow in my course. They go from uh, basics. And this is a very good book, Cell Biology by the Numbers. To get a bit an idea on, on scales, you know, the forces of uh, space and distances, the energies of biotic systems. Very good for introduction. I use also a lot of uh, basics on stochastic process, in particular these two books that Rafael and I we know very well, um, and are really they contain the basis for physicists on stochastic process. And this one is like a mixture of, of ideas in, in biology and ideas in stochastic process together. Uh, and this um, book I follow quite quite a lot in my, in my course. It's a bit advanced, but it's quite nice if you want to do biophysics because it shows a lot of uh, stochastic models that you can solve. So you can go to the blackboard and find uh, exact solutions for many properties that then you can use it in an experiment to, to extract the useful information from biology. Okay, so um, I will present some of the, of the models that I discussed that are very, very simple. Uh, biological systems. One uh, paradigm is um, an ion channel. So an ion channel is like a gate that uh, cells have in their membrane. So here we have a gate of the, the door of this room, but we also have gates in our cells which open and close to allow the selective entrance or, or escape of uh, molecules. For instance, a cell um, takes food from the, from the environment or it, it also takes ions 
I also have an electrical charges. These electrical charges, for example, are important in, in the um, transmission of information, in, for example, in, in neurons. So this is a very okay, simple object, if you look at it from, from far, which you can describe as a gate that is open or closed. And this gate opens and closes to plastic because it has plastic. It's a very, very small gate. It's not that someone comes and opens it. The gate is so small that opens and, and closes spontaneously due to fluctuations. And this you can model it as a Markov process in the same way of what Andre was explaining yesterday. You have two states, open and closed, and uh, you can jump from this state to this state at a random time. So there is a rate of opening, sorry, this is a rate of closing in this case, a rate of opening, which are two numbers that are given. Okay. And, uh, you can do an analysis of what is the probability to be here and probability to be here. That will depend on the values of these rates that typically depend also on, on biological parameters. So here below, I'm showing you, a, this is an experiment. So experimentalists could see the current through a channel. So you can put a, a, a perimeter and measure how much electrical current passes through a channel. Electrical current means there are ions that are passing. By the time. And these ions generate electricity in a car. And uh, something very important is to see that there are, in this uh, channel, there are like two values. And, okay, this is uh, okay. They, they remove the offset, so it's either zero or this one. Then it's like jumping. Someone is jumping between two values. Okay, so it, it seems like uh, an object that is going from this state to this state uh, at random times. And uh, you see another thing that's very important is the, the value. So the current here is five pico ampere. You design an electrical circuit, uh, microscopic, you will have an ampere of electricity. An ampere is one coulomb per second. Here we have pico amperes. So there are 10 to the minus 12 amperes per second. It's a very tiny, 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 tiny current. But still, it can be identified and measured experimentally. Okay? So this is a, an experimental motivation to show you that this type of models that we explain in this course and in, in this school makes sense. Okay, because they are really real experimental schools. Yes, another thing just to, to emphasize is that the time that the channel spends in one side and in the other, it's a random variable. It's not always the same. It's not like a clock. It's not something that is it takes some time, and this time is a distribution. Okay. Like some, someone is here, that spends some time and then jump at a random time. Okay. And the residence time, residence time we call how much time you spend on average here or here, depends on the value of the rates. Okay. You see here in this uh, time series, it's more time in the closed than the open state. This will mean that it's more time here, so it means that this K minus will be smaller than the K plus. If you want to do a good model, should be a model that to describe this experimental time series, k minus should be smaller than k. Okay. This is one example, but uh, there are many other things you can explain in, in physics. For example, uh, yesterday you saw in, in the movie by the movies of Eva Tolitz, these polymers that were forming, creating, and destroying spans of time. So they are dynamical objects. It's not that motors move in, the, in, in tracks that are fixed. It's not like a highway that is just given, not from me to regular. No, it's a highway that is being uh, created from one side all the time and, and destroyed from the other side. It's a dynamical object, and you can you can do uh, also stochastic models to describe this, this type of phenomenon. It's more complicated than the ion channel, zero one. one It's a model that will describe the length of the polymer that will be changing at random times, but um, it's also a classic. Okay, uh, okay, this was the, the idea. This was basically what, what Eva was explaining yesterday that microtubules, which is the place where, where chromosomes are segregated, um, are um, continuously being polymerized into polymerized. It's a dynamical object. So, um, about motors, yesterday some of you asked me how do you model the motor, how does it move, etc. So, uh, this is a more precise description of a molecular motor in which we have the machine, 
that is uh, being fueled by ATP. So there's a chemical reaction that gives energy to this motor. But this energy typically uh, is used to move the motor in one direction. Whereas on the other side, the motor is connected to a cargo that can be trapped with a laser. So you can design an experiment where a laser is, is, being, is trapping uh, um, colloid, and this colloid is being pulled by the motor. So if you do this, it's like you have some, someone who is putting you a big backpack, and the backpack is it's like pressing you backwards, so it's um, opposing the, the net motion of the motor. Um, so here there is like a tug of war. We have on one side the chemistry pushing in one direction, and the other one the, the, the mechanics pushing in the other direction. So typically what we do when we model this motion would be a random walk. So there will be a, a motor that is a, a particle in a, in a lattice that is jumping between sides. And these sides are like the different monomers of a polymer. Polymer has like uh, units and the motor is, is jumping between these units. Uh, and a very simple model would be this one. So it would be a, a random walk in which you have a rate K plus to jump to the next. So you go from zero to one or from one to two, and a rate K minus to jump backwards. And of course, you will tell me, okay, this is fine, but this, why does this need to be a motor? Typically, this can be a particle, it could, this could be whatever, no? But um, then, okay, what you can find in my course is that typically we relate these two via little balance condition, what Andre explained yesterday. But uh, this K plus and K minus are related to the free energy change in this chemical reaction and also to the external force. So the K plus and K minus should have, should be functions of these parameters, the external force and the chemical potential of the chemical reaction. They should appear in K plus and K minus. Otherwise, you don't do biophysics, you are doing just mathematical. Okay. You can do random walks or by. I can do Brownian motion without having this. So in the end, biophysics is about using physics models that you have to input here functions. So K plus will be a function of, of the different forces, the chemical and the mechanical. Okay, if you are curious, later I can show you how to do this with the equations. But I'm just, okay, this was supposed to be an introduction, so I'm just trying to give you the ideas. Um, moreover, it's not all about single motor. So just you know, want to understand a single motor moving. It's not the only important thing in biophysics. I told you yesterday that collective effects are important. So to move a, um, a muscle fiber, you need the action of many, many of these ones. Right? They are, they are rowing, you know. So to model this, you can do like a co more complicated version of what I show here, in which instead of having only one motor, you do a model where there are many of these motors. Here, what I show uh, below, it is called flashing ratchet, uh, to be very precise. And uh, what I show below are, um, it's a model of many motors that are connected to a backbone. So the backbone will be practically this thing. Okay. Um, and in which each of the particles is the position of a single motor. So you can do a model of many motors connected to a backbone, like here, in which, um, the motors can be attached or detached at random times. So you see the motor can be here free or it can be attached to the fiber. And how do you model this? It's by doing this type of dynamics in which you have the motors, which are these balls here uh, that are connected with the spring to the backbone here. And then they can attach and detach in between two different potentials. Okay, these are um, uh, potential energies. That can be the potential energy of the motor when it's free, which is this one, or the potential energy of the motor when it's bound to the polymer, which is this one. You see, this, this energy is periodic. So it, it repeats every monomer. Not only is periodic, but it's asymmetric. It's asymmetric because you are not just, so these structures are roughly asymmetric. They are not perfectly um, symmetric in, in space. So, when you have this type of model and you do switches, so these, um, these spheres here are switching at random times, you generate, so just by having uh, these, these dynamics, you generate a current. So you can make this object to move in a given direction. 
it's something quite non-trivial. And I explained this in my course with, with, with Matt, but um, it's best to tell you that you can generate net motion by switching particles between potentials. Okay. In principle, if you want to generate motion, you need an external force. You need someone pushing. Here, there's no one pushing. It's just things that are being switched on and off. You are like um, shining a light and uh, shining a light stochastic for each of the motors. You're changing the energy all the time. And this generates motion. It can generate move the, the fiber in this direction. This was really 20 years ago in biophysics. This was really the, the, one of the main issues to solve. So we were seeing motion. But we, we don't have in cells, we don't have heat engines like the engine of a car. The engine of a car moves because it's a heat engine. So it, it, it's, it's a system that is in contact with two thermal baths the fuel, which is hot, and the air, which is cold. When you have this type of machine, it's very easy to generate power to move things. But here, they are not, there's not a fuel and the air, it's, everything is in the same temperature. So for people working in thermodynamics, it was really fascinating to say, Okay, there is a machine that is moving in one direction, but that is not a it's not a heat engine. Okay, this. I was just curious to say everything the same temperature, and uh, I think you were starting to find out that that's not always the case in the other way. No, okay. But I wonder how much how you can have temperature fluctuations, but not enough to okay. generate more net motion in one direction. But how how big a temperature difference would you need at this scale in order to do much higher than what it is. Uh, I can I can send you a reference where it's discussed. But okay, it's much higher than than what you would be have. Okay. So there are temperature fluctuations, but they are super small, like a cell. In a, in a cell, you nice. pick a cell, you put, put a thermometer, maximum you will see a one Kelvin in a okay. Maximum. So, it's a machine that is in contact with a single thermal bath and, and yet moves. And this is because, okay, two things, is broken in the balance. And second is because there is this asymmetric potential. So having an, an as a potential is asymmetric, then it's motion in one direction. Okay, but uh, if you want more details, I can okay, tell you a reference or, 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 the, or the lecture where I explain this, but I just wanted to introduce models, so present models. For the motion of a single motor, we use this type of random walks, which can be in discrete, like a particle jumping in a lattice between sides, or it can be also continuous. Sometimes we use that this moves in the real line, depending on the cases, it's a good approximation. And that to describe collective effects, we use similar models, but in uh, of many particles, many particles, please. Yes, but when you propose the, the random walk for the single motor, like, why would you propose that in particular? I mean, is this the simplest model that you have, or you have some distribution for the times and you say, okay, this is the distribution of a random motion? Or yeah, so this is the simplest, actually. This is this is to start. Okay. Mm -hmm. The simplest you can imagine. You have a machine moving in a line, yeah. and I can think about this. But then uh, it comes to the fact, what you say, exactly, you can look at the waiting time distribution in each of the sites. And maybe the waiting time distribution is not and described by a random walk. This could be because um, here I am assuming that in every jump, I'm consuming ATP. But it could be that the motor makes a step because of a fluctuation. Mm -hmm. It could be that the, the ATP molecule didn't bind to the motor. So in that case, this description will not be enough. Will not because we will have two variables. We will have on one side the position of the motor, this will be x, and on the other would be the ATP consumption, which will be y. We will have a random walk in two dimensions. Okay. <laughs> okay, maybe uh, can I take a can I draw something because it's being very <laughs> frustrating that I cannot <laughs> anywhere, I'm fine. But can you please Repeat. So, uh, yeah, so the simplest model you can think of is a random walk. But in, in many in one dimension, one dimension. the simplest model I can think of of uh, directed motions. But it could be that this model is not enough to explain experimental because 
if you have okay this will be a mark of process like the one uh, andre explained there. a mark of process uh, in a mark of process the waiting time distribution is exponential so you spend a random time in space it's in a set of exponential distribution, exponential distribution. But sometimes you go to an experiment, you, you look at the waiting times and they are not exponential. It can happen. Then this model is not enough. So you need to, to build a more precise model. Okay. So to the dimensional uh, random walk uh, can uh, be used instead of one exponential waiting time? Uh, Could be because after all, here, you see only one dimension. So you could have a two-dimensional random walk in which you don't see the second dimension. And this is very common. So, okay, so, so Elgas, when you add another dimension, it's like you are adding like the hidden information the that hidden, you're not considering. Exactly, the hidden information. So here I'm saying every time I'm doing a job, I'm using ATP. But you could do a more yeah, different model in which you have the variable X, which will be the position, and the variable Y, which will be the number of ATPs that are consumed. In this model, I'm saying every time I do a jump, I spend ATP. So if I go from zero to one, I will also spend one ATP. So I will do it like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then when I'm here, okay, I can go back. The chemical reaction in the step. So it will be like this. So I'm doing something like this. This is ATP. But I'm not okay. I'm not losing any information. If I'm doing a random walk in this way, you see, if I look at X, it's the same as I'm looking at it. But there are motors that do not work like this. They're more complicated. They are something like this. So uh, they can do the following. So I am in this state, and they can move without using a TP. This could be a, a flat twist. So this is again y the ATP and this is x which is the position. So could, they could do like this and go backwards. But they can also do the same jump using ATP like this. Okay. And you could also say, okay, there are events where there is like a chemical reaction happening, but the motor doesn't move. You could have something like this in vertical. So in this case, you will have a random walk in two dimensions. You maybe you do like this, then 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 like this, this, okay, something like this. So now in the experiment, just one second. In the experiment, you cannot see the ATP. You can only see the projection of this trajectory in X. So then the model that I presented now is accurate, and the waiting time distribution in each of these states, okay. The way I in the coarse grain state, in which I don't see the one, will not be exponential. Okay. So you have to be very careful. Somehow, it's what Eva was saying yesterday. If you have an experiment, you can invalidate these models. It's what you may have this experiment, okay, this theory, and then uh, this theory predicts that the time spent in one state is exponential. So the distribution of that time versus time is exponential theory. But then maybe in the experiment, but this happens a lot. You have a distribution of this. Then you have to this is not a good model. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but you would you couldn't describe the this the experiment the left with a different k. Okay. Sometimes no, nine. sometimes no. There are features that are common to all random walks. Mm -hmm. All random walks, all models that have k plus k minus, yeah, they have, they have co some common features. And one of them is exponential waiting time. Yeah. And but there are many approaches. You could do a Markovian process in two dimensions, or you could do uh, another model in which you have a Levy walk, or you have, you have a, a random walk with non exponential distribution, mm -hmm. as you can also do in one dimension. There are many possibilities. Mm -hmm. There are many possibilities. But typically in biophysics, we try to find a Markovian. Dynamics, which in this case would be okay, you are in X, go to X plus one with some rate, then go backward, okay, this is with Y, or you can go like this, or you can go like this. This would be this model. Okay. 
the typical approach in Okay. Actually, it's very nice that they have um, this whiteboard now. <laughs> I have a question about the, the graph. Like when the when the motor goes back, you like obtain NTP. Yeah, yeah. You are doing the reverse reaction. Okay. And this in there are motors in which this is very, very unlikely, but there are motors where this is happening a lot. Okay. You synthesize NTP instead of burning. For you can have the the reaction but without uh, yeah, it can happen. I mean, you don't cross the threshold for me, or just uh, no. I mean, it could be that the, the, we are neglecting a lot of details in the motor. We are not adding the structure of the motor. So yeah. maybe this is what you put in the situation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There was one question here. Yeah, we were sort of related. It's just that so uh, it's the passivity of the motor without these uh, empty steps that is due to the binding of the ATP, and then the passivity. Of the water surrounding the water is the empty steps. Okay, for this I need an equation, but <laughs> typically, typically what you do here, yeah. let me let me take that simple one. Let me take that simple one and assume that I'm here. So in, in this type of dynamics where every step has a has a um, span of activity. Yeah. You use this, the typical relation between the rates is written like this. So K plus. Over k minus. Remember k plus here is k of x going to x plus one. There's a count forward and k minus is the rate of going from x to x minus one. Okay, this is jump pattern. Typically, the relation we use is uh, called local intervalance, which Andre explained yesterday, which we write here the exponential of uh, um, Beta times F L uh, so beta delta mu delta mu minus F L. It's called local intervals. And you will see this a lot in the in Andres course. It's potential of something beta. Is related to the thermal fluctuations. It's one over KVT. Okay, here is the temperature. Delta mu is the um, free energy change. So, how much energy one hydrolysis of ATP gives you? So, delta mu is the free energy change in the chemical reaction. So, this would be mu ATP and mu ATP. Uh, so this is energy. This is the force exerted in the liquid small f, exerted by the motor, and this is L is the step size. Okay. This is step. So you recognize here this is work, force time displacement, and this also is energy, and this is also energy. And they have different signs. Okay, this is a way of putting chemistry. And mechanics together in this model. So now you say k minus is one, for example, you say one second minus one, and k plus will be one second minus one times this. So when the chemistry is strong, k plus will be much larger than k minus. Typically, this is what we do. But this is when you say in every step you have both. If you have more complicated models, like I say, in, in, uh, this, okay, this, this, here. you have something like this, but you can jump like this, like this, or like this. There are more rates. It's not just, there are not only two rates, forward, backward. There are also these ones and these ones. And here, each of them is different. So, okay, so this, this. So the diagonal will be written like this. So this is in a paper with Alexander. <laughs> He was doing master degree. You have this, but you can also have this step in which you don't spend ATP. It's just a fluctuation. Okay. And this two, let me call it uh, K plus mm, X and K minus X. These two are related in a different way. 
So there, chemistry doesn't play any role. So you have something like this, a plus x divided by k minus x is exponential of minus beta effect. Just this. Because in that step, there's no ATP consumption. Okay, get my point. I'm being a bit fast. No, I understand this. I just wondered where the kick came from. Like, you didn't incorporate water in this case. No, but uh, beta, yeah. beta is one of the thermal energy. Yeah, exactly. The so kicks are here hidden. So I thought you would have already taken care of it, but doesn't matter. But the kicks are here because it's in beta. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Hi, that's higher. why I thought it was here that you had to add an extra step. No, no, okay. Okay, <laughs> the water is everywhere and it's generating fluctuations. Yeah. And it's included here, thermal particles. But then there are external forces. So we say there is an environment which is made of water, and then there are external forces. One is chemical and one is mechanical. This is typical in, in physical mechanics. The thermal bath appears as one single parameter. How do you generate stochastic trajectories is another thing. How do you do it? But I can explain. Yes, I'm... This I can explain. I can explain. But short answer is you generate trajectories as in any Markov process, okay? which is called using the Gillespie algorithm. <laughs> but, but using the, but the Gillespie algorithm with these rates, which are biological parameters. I, I think I, you misunderstood me, but we don't have to take it here. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we'll go with this. Uh, okay, but it's good you ask me questions because then I see if we understand or not, and we can have separate sessions from this format. But now, <laughs> if a problem is not me, right? Okay, so the mean rate and I don't know if the local is going to help me. Yeah, also questions. Yes, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> I go to them here. I think we need them. Ah, good. You're right. Good. Great. Um, exactly. Okay, so I hope the people online is not worried. So, um, okay, as I said, there, there are more complicated um, dynamics. The one I was telling you is just a random walk in a line, which is really the simplest. But there are other um, molecular motors that have more complex dynamics where we have cycles and we include. Okay, what I said before was just saying the chemical reaction happens all of a sudden, and we cannot see intermediate steps during the chemical reaction. But there are cases where we can see. We can see a structural changes during the hydrolysis cycle. If we can see it in the microscope or with um, optical tweezers techniques, then we must do a model which has all these states. Here, for example, the, you have ATP binding, the ATP is hydrolyzed when it's bounded, then it's released. So there are hydrolyzations when, when it's bound and unbound. So you have more complicated dynamics that sometimes are, are essential to describe the, the dynamics of. The motors. Which, by, by the way, you asked me about ITP synthesis. And ITP synthesis is essential because I tell you, we, we get ATP. We get ATP from food, but there are um, several plants produce ATP from, from, from the energy of the sun. And this is, they need to do this reaction, but the reaction has to be also backwards. And the molecular motor that is responsible for that is called F1 ATPs. It's quite famous, quite, quite important in nature. And uh, the model that, that is used typically is a three state or six state model. So you as a physicist can do quite a lot for, for us to, um, about this, this model. But here it's, it's clear that ATP synthesis happens. Not that there's only in one direction. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm talking about topics that I, I talk uh, I deal with in my course, and another one is cell sensing. So an important problem is how a cell senses the environment. So sometimes the cell has to take decisions, has to divide, or it has to differentiate, uh, etc. So it has to be able to sense what is happening in the surroundings. 
and they are really beautiful models of how a cell can sense, or for example, how, how a cell can count molecules and how precise. Precisely with, with models, which is like uh, an antenna that is uh, measuring uh, the number of particles in a sphere from the antenna. And I discuss okay, it's a classic, classic paper by Berg and Purcell. Uh, I can give you a reference later, where, which discusses what is the uh, precision of the perfect cell. Perfect cell is a, is a physical model for, for, a, for a sphere that counts molecules. What is the accuracy of a cell counting? The molecules surrounding the cell. And it's a really nice paper. I will share with you the, the reference later um, because the, it has a, an analogy also between biology and electrostatics. They use models of, of electrical, uh, it's, a, it's a spherical capacitor with charges, which is used to solve uh, counting problem, problem in the cell. It's really, really nice. This is just to give you a smell of we can, can use solved problems in physics. Study biology. Okay. okay, now I will go to further applications of biophysics, so something more modern that I learned in my last years uh, as researchers, uh, going to conference or going to schools, etc. Beyond motor, so this is way out of classics, so motor is really a classic. One example is the development. Uh, here I put an example of C. elegans embryo. C. elegans is a worm that you can see it uh, almost at naked eye. Looks like this, and it's used quite a lot by biologists, mainly because it's transparent. So you can see, you can see the um, um, anatomy of the C. elegans without requiring very complicated, expensive microscopes. So you can see, for instance, um, the development. You can see how a new worm is born inside the, the, this worm. You can see how. Uh, eggs are formed in the C. elegans and they are developed. And uh, over the last year, there's been an incredible progress in this field. And for example, this is a nature paper from 2010, where they measure the forces that are acting uh, when uh, in the eggs of this C. elegans assembly. You can measure velocity fields, cause of forces. So something that I cannot see here is that um, there are uh, very useful tools from physics that are used to model the, the X here in the C. elegans, the development, how they grow, how they differentiate, and if they are fluid dynamics and differential geometry. So here they use differential geometry to describe this process because this is a, it's an ellipsoid, it has forces that are tangential to the ellipsoid. So it's, it's really, really advanced. And you can see that the highly theoretical concept of physics can be used in biology. So it's not just random works. An example I'm showing that uh, that is really an extremely growing field in biology is phase separation. So mm -hmm. phase separation for a physicist is like water and ice, okay? very, very classic problem. But now biologists have found that in, in this embryo that I was talking about, there is a phase separation, liquid liquid phase separation. So all of a sudden, there is during development, the creation, you see, this is a cell division, eh? there are two nuclei here. There are droplets that form in one side of the egg, only in one side. Okay. What is this? And it turns out that this, this is related to where the, the tail of the, the head of the animal will be developed. That these are molecules that will have information about creating an asymmetric animal. We need to create asymmetries, otherwise we don't have head and tail. So, <laughs> and, and this is really fascinating. And there's a lot of um, research on this topic. Uh, which uses classical algorithm thermodynamics and phase transitions to try to explain why this phenomenon. Because here, what you see is that there, are, there is the creation of organelles, which are like droplets, like droplets of water created here, and they are separated from the rest of the cell. So it's another example, quite modern. Another one that I, I know a bit better are is endocytosis in human cells, which is um, okay, here I'm showing you an example of a, uh, of a cell with a big nucleus. Where you see different colors. Different colors typically biologists use to see different proteins. Okay, you can do fluorescence of proteins. So, moreover, some of these proteins are like indicators of the fact, okay, they are like um, labels of smaller vesicles that are called endosomes. As I said, cells can sense the environment, they have channels, but they are also 
formation of vesicles. So this is like an invagination of the membrane that creates a, be a, a vesicle called endosomes. So endocytosis takes in material. And uh, in the late years, there were many quantitative analysis here. So it's, it's just um, biology is really exploding in terms of producing data. Right now, there's so many labs that can do so precise measurements that it's really big opportunity for this. And they can count how many of these endosomes are in the cell and how many molecules they have inside. So we can have an idea of how many and how, how fat they are. And uh, in physics, the, there have been approaches to describe this um, phenomenon of endocytosis and endocytic network. Like if it were the formation of, of, uh, of clusters containing molecules. So it is like they use population dynamics models to say, for example, two endosomes can fuse together and make a bigger endosome. Or also endosome can split into different parts, or they can transform into a different type of vesicle, etc. So you can use this type of statistical physics or population dynamics models to describe what happens in a single cell. So it's really fascinating and, and quite challenging because the equations you see are quite complicated here yeah, to they're called integral differential equations. So it's not just random box. This is my, my main message I want to give today. And another topic that I like a lot and I do did a lot of research is on the hearing. In particular, in bullfrogs, there are fascinating experiments where um, researchers are able to see what happens in the inner ear of the bullfrog. The inner ear of the bullfrog, surprisingly, very similar to the human at the inner, inner part. Okay. And there are cells that, okay, I will talk about them later in more detail, where in the surface of the cell, you have an antenna. Antenna, which is called Herschel bundle, and um, it, it moves in a stochastic manner, like I show here. So this will be the motion of, of the top of the antenna. And um, there has been a lot of um, data extracted from these um, um, animals during hearing. And um, okay, I'm, I'm missing something, but <laughs> there is 40 years of modeling of these cells already. And people use the plastic process quite a lot, and also dynamical systems. And now we are even doing the thermodynamics. So how much heat is dissipated by a single cell during hearing? And I've done several years of research, and later I'll, I'll try to give you more, more, more information for this. Okay. Something else I want to say is uh, I see the interaction between physics and biology like a two-way journey. There are different subfields. If I say biophysics for me is a very broad thing, but there are other fields that are related, such as bioinformatics or mathematical biology or ecology, which what they do some way, some way is to ask questions interesting, interesting for biologists and use physics concepts to answer these questions. For example, how can a molecular motor move such big loads? Or how do birds fly in blocks? I think this is something that Biology would be interesting to know. And then we can give physics answers to this. But it's a two way journey. One can also say, I am a physicist and I have physics questions. And I want to use a poor bug or a biological system to, to answer physics questions. This is taken care of by a field called active matter or stochastic thermodynamics, which I work, or uh, free biology and others. Example here, one question is you can't read, but is what is the heat capacity of a bacteria? Okay. Heat capacity is a, is a physics quantity. So how much heat a uh, system absorbs when I change the temperature in the environment? It's called heat capacity. Let's say, what is the heat capacity of a bacteria? This is a physics question because we say I know what is the heat capacity of water, I know what is the weight. Okay, uh, but I don't know more activity. So for me, the biological system is another system that I can study. With. So we do also this way. And this is okay. typically physicists do this trick. Okay. Sometimes it's this trick, it's very challenging because you have to enter a lab, learn biology, and be able to identify important questions in biology. It's harder than this, but it's also 
extremely exciting and it has many opportunities and it was very relevant for science. Okay. Just to tell you that there are different disciplines and, and they are different questions and different questions. For instance, this is a very growing field, active matter, where you can see models of the particles that uh, swim, like they say, like bacteria. But typically, then you read a paper about that and you see all the parameters are equal to one. Okay. <laughs> this you won't see in biophysics because in biophysics, numbers matter. So if it's important, what is the rate? The rate is one per second, or, or it's not the same. A motor moves and makes one step per second that it makes 100 steps per second. Okay, so different directions, different techniques, and different methods. And I will give you a little bit on about active matter. I don't know how much time we have. 15 minutes, okay, very good. And recent experimental insights and techniques in this field of active matter that I just briefly uh, introduced. So first of all, let me talk about uh, Classic um, physics um, problem, which is called Feynman's ratchet. I don't know who in this room knows what is Feynman's ratchet. Two, three people. Okay, one of this. So Feynman, uh, in his um, in his book Lectures in Physics, he he proposed this type of experiment, which is very fascinating. In which what you do is the following: you have two um, thermal baths. Two boxes that are disconnected, and these boxes can be held at different temperatures. So one is hot, one is cold, or vice versa. Inside the boxes, you have on one side this, which is called vein, you have a totally symmetric object, and on the on the left side you have this type of ratchet wheel, which is connected to a pole. Okay? So this, this is kind of constraining the motion of the ratchet. So the question is, if we attach an object to the axis, to, to the axis connecting the two, the two thermal bars, can we make this ball leap? Can we raise this ball? It's not a trivial question, but Feynman found that if the two thermal bars are at different temperatures, you can lift away. By putting in contact two thermal bars and an object, you can lift this object. Okay. So, it may seem to you quite strange, but it is somehow related to what a heat engine does. Heat engine is in contact with two thermal bars, and as a result, you can move a car. It's a, it's a transfer of energy from here to here, but not all the energy is transferred to this motion, but part of it makes the, the ball move. So, the weight can be lifted, this was Feynman's conclusion, if the two temperatures are different. So without, okay, without the second temperature, the wheel does not move on average, because unless, okay, you have someone who is rotating in this case, okay? But we are assuming there's no one doing a torque in this machine. So if we have the, the, this in a thermal bar, this will not move, will not have a, a net uh, rotation in one way. So something that I want to emphasize as well is that this is motion generated by fluctuations. These are small objects in thermal bars, and fluctuations are what, what generate most. So this is converting fluctuations into motion. So this was Feynman's conclusion. So if you put a wheel, so I, I take a glass of water and I put a small wheel there, you don't expect that it will rotate, right? I mean, why it should it should be rotated? Unless if I do like this, of course. But I'm not going to, to exert a torque. Okay, so some people. Uh, so researchers uh, um, 15 years ago, they said, okay, what if we put a wheel in a bacterial bath? So we put it in water, but the water is a dirty water. So it's filled of bacteria. So this is what happened. This is the wheel. It's a microscopic wheel with millimeters. And it happens in water. The wheel starts rotating. Let you put this wheel, symmetric wheel, in a bacterial bath, the wheel rotates autonomously. When you are using a biological system, move things, generate power. Okay, now is my question to the audience why is this happening? Why we have bacteria, it rotates. If you put the same wheel in water, 
TVs and the TVs are like an object maker. Yeah, but they can put a laser and heat the water to the south of equilibrium because it's anticipating on heat. Any other? The criteria for filming cells forward and they somehow get stuck in these um, sharp angles and push the wheel forward. Yeah, the other, yeah, they don't get stuck in the other direction, so to say, so you can see each other. Yes, that's, that's exactly the point. The bacteria are self propelled So they, they get stuck. You said that they get stuck in this angle, and because of the symmetry, they generate a rotation. It's really a, it's really generated by self propulsion of bacteria. Bacteria are not as small as water. They are self propulsion they get stick here, they self propel and then they, they press in this direction, whereas in the other direction they escape free. So the asymmetry of the wheel together with the cell propulsion of bacteria generates motion. But just to tell you that we can use biological systems to, to extract power and to extract energy. And of course, this was really the, the first design, but so in the last years they, they did something more advanced, in which here is like a parking of I don't know, 12 or 16 different bacteria that enter and move this wheel, and they could generate this in, in, a, in a larger scale. This is a 3D printed um, ratchet wheel, and they could do something much more spectacular, which is a, a series of, of these wheels connected to each other that are not one after the other. But it's, uh, it's something that is scaling and something that is quite something interesting for, for physicists and that can have even uh, engineering applications in the future. So it's not just that we burn the bacteria and extract energy from this, but then we can rotate more things and, and extract power. So it's, it's quite spectacular. But it's one of many. Okay, so um, I can, as I was saying, uh, I've been studying quite a lot. Uh, hearing, hearing in the end is the following if you, you, there is sound that enters the ear, and this sound is transformed into an electrical current that goes to the auditory nerve on the brain. We are studying this quite a lot. We have a lot of insights, but what is not so common, this happens okay, again, this happens in the ears. What we study is what happens in the cochlea, where there are this, uh, this tissue uh, filled of hair cells. So this uh, antenna that I was talking about is this part of the this large body cell, ear hair cell. Uh, and these are the final responsibles of transducing the sound into an electrical signal that then goes to the nerve that is connected here. So this process is known quite well. There are 40 years of modern, as I said. But what, something that could be a bit crazy is what if instead of sound, we, we shine light to a cell in the ear. Maybe we can stimulate a part of the cell and, and transform this light in electricity, like in photoelectric effect. It may sound crazy, but um, I can leave a bit of this, but there were recent um, uh, experiments where they did this. Actually, I know that the authors of, the, of this article and they told me it was just by chance. So they, they started to see a cell vibrating on its own when they left uh, the window open on a Saturday working in the lab. So it was really <laughs> strange discovery. But uh, later on, they did this experiment where they shine uh, one of these cells with ultraviolet light and they can shine it uh, in different regions. So you can shine it in a small region of the cell, like this uh, purple or orange, but you can shine it in a bigger region, this. And let's see what is the uh, motion of the tip of the cell under this illumination. And they saw that when you illuminate for a, in a larger uh, region, the vibration gets amplified. Since when you amplify motion, you're just shining light to the ear. So the ear is not designed to use light, sound, <laughs> but it's quite fascinating. And then they, they also studied, um, okay, what they say is that this is a process happening, is exciting the mitochondria of the cell and is generating electrical currents. Um, but they also measure is the, the displacement of the cell as a function of the frequency of the light and see that it's more um, sensitive to ultraviolet light than the one in sound. So these are opportunities for physicists and still the many things to do and to, to study. Huh? Uh, and I don't know how much I'll... Five minutes, okay. I'll try my best. <laughs>
Um, <laughs> 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 so, I don't remember. Okay, I think. Okay, I think maybe ten minutes. So um, I'll give an appetizer about applications of stochastic thermodynamics in biophysics. This is really a extremely growing field. So in five minutes, I'll do my best. Um, one of the first things that is quite interesting for me is to find the non-equilibrium signatures of light. So on the left, I see. Um, an object that is fluctuating, and then on the right I see another object that is fluctuating, and then it's moving. And one can ask the question: Okay, do you see any difference in this in the motion of these two objects? We have something special that's the same, but what I'm showing on the left is a dead object, so it's a colloidal particle, it's a plastic particle in water. It has passive equilibrium dynamics and dynamics is reversible. On the right, I'm showing a red blood cell, it's like a disc. Okay, red blood cell looks like disc. And it fluctuates, but it looks there's a random motion as well. But we know that, I think we didn't know if red blood cells are equilibrium or non equilibrium. No idea. But we would like to use physics, concepts from physics, to, to say it. Things about is this alive or not? And how much alive is this? So it's not a trivial question, you see. But now that here that is ADP consumption and this heat dissipates, it gives no okay. But we don't have a calorimeter, which is so small, and we don't have an ATP counter. So we have to do what we can with this information. Let's see. Um, okay. Sometimes things are quite like this is the red blood cell fluctuating. But in a lot of cases, you could look at a biological system that is clearly out of equilibrium. This is a chlamydia monad, which is a micro swimmer. You see it's using its arms to, to, to swim. And here you see clearly this is clearly a non equilibrium system because it has a direction, it has a current, and in the motion of the arms is dissipating energy. So it's friction. What is the difference between irreversibility and strong irreversibility? Uh, okay, here you don't see that it's weak irreversibility because it's difficult to see by eye. Ah, okay. It's not apparent. Okay. Here is it's seen by eye. You see the thing is moving in a direction. The peronium particle will never do this, it will not move in a given direction. But this could be the zooming in a peronium particle. So this is not apparent, it is, it's hard. But hard problems usually are more interesting than the simple. So, um, what this is really an appetizer, what people did, uh, and some research, uh, what the research group did was to trap one single red blood cell. What they do mainly is to trap, in reality, they don't trap the cell, they trap four particles with laser that are attached to this red blood cell. And then they look at how these particles vibrate in time. So here there are two curves, and in five minutes, I'm not able to explain these two curves, but one is related to the fluctuations. So how these molecules vibrate? What is the energy of the molecules during the equilibrium vibration? Okay, the spontaneous vibration. And the other curve is what happens if you take one of these molecules and you, sorry, one of these particles and you drive it. You do, for example, a sinusoidal force, back and forth, back and forth. Then you look at the response of the red blood cell when you do this uh, forcing. And what, what the researchers found is that the response and the spontaneous fluctuation are different. And this is a signature of non equilibrium. It's called the fluctuation response relation. The fluctuations, which is the spontaneous motion of the red blood cell, and the response to an external force do not coincide. I'm not giving formulas, but okay, if you are interested, we can talk later. But after some time, we will see that. Yeah, after some time, the red blood cell activity, it depends on ATP. And after some time, so here is after two days, they get the same fluctuation response out of each other. And this is a dead red blood cell. 
<laughs> so this that in a no sense response. <laughs> not responsive. Okay, it responds because there is a response, but it's the same as the fluctuate response to a fluctuate. When these two curves coincide, it means the response to a force is the same that will the response to a fluctuate. And this happens after two days. And here we classify the reversal as it is the you see, you can use thermodynamics to even quantify life. So how a life is a cell. Life cycle. Please. Okay, in the y axis, it, it's the, okay, I'm going to be a bit technical, but this is the Fourier transform of the correlation function. It's called the power spectrum density. Okay, and the other one is the imaginary part of the response function. There's two of them. So first, you take you have a trajectory. Okay, explain with word. You have a trajectory in time, and then you do the the power spectrum of the trajectory. Yeah. So you go to the Fourier space. You check the, the station uh, in the in the Fourier space. It's broken. Partition dissipation is broken, but they are not the same when it's alive, and it's recovered when the cell is dead. So what you are plotting is the PSD of the movement of the sensing particle of the red plus cell. Is the PSD uh, the power spectrum? Yes, yes. Of, the, of the motion of the, the red plus cell. Of the red plus cell. Yeah. Okay. The flick, this this uh, phenomenon is called flickering of the memory. But you can do this type of technique in many systems. Eh? For example, in the hair bundle, there is one variable x. And this was done. And, and it was shown also that it's broken when it's alive. And when the cell is dead, it's in, it's in. So this is really a, a way to classify if a system is non-equilibrium or equilibrium. And this was not known. So it was not known that the, the flickering of the red blood cell was non-equilibrium until this experiment, 2016. Okay? This is very recent. Six years ago, there was debate. This is just a flat equilibrium fluctuation, or is non-equilibrium. Okay. Moreover. These are data points experimental, and this is, there is a line that comes from a physical model. So you can use these experimental uh, measurements to design and to, uh, to improve models. Yes? Just for fun, but you're kind of poking it to see if it's dead, right? Sorry? You're kind of poking it to see if it's dead. I don't understand this better. Meaning no. that in the experiment, you're kind of protruding it to see if it's dead or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, that's a microscale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah good, good point. But just to say, in the head bundle, is we could do that without poking. Okay. This is what I'm going to explain in two minutes if I can. I think it's hard because I, I worked on this for nine years. <laughs> okay. I'll try to be quick. So this is our friend Lothar. Question is Mason. Um, this is the type of bullfrog from where we extract cells. Uh, they first the bullfrog, it's simplified. I, I don't do experiments. I'm, I'm trying to explain how they do the experiment. The bullfrog is sacrificed, then a piece of the ear is cut, and this piece of the ear, of the cochlea, which is very small, is put in a solution, and it's put in the fridge. And then uh, after some time, you take this solution um, to a plate and you put um, ions. I'm being very extremely descriptive, I'm, I'm not extremely descriptive. And the cell starts to do like this. So this is in fact it's life after death because the, the animal is killed, yeah? but still cells are oscillating because inside the cells there are motors that consume ATP. So still, if you give ATP to that cell, it will vibrate on its own. And one can measure with a fiber, a glass fiber, the motion of this top of the cell this will be X. Uh, okay, so like this. And okay, as your colleague was saying, you could be forcing the cell, or you could be just looking at how the fiber uh, is moved by the cell. This would be not, not poking right, in your language. Okay, and just got this term expressed. So you may do a non poking experiment, but you just look at the vibration of this cell. Spans of time and look at these traits. 
x versus time. And you may think maybe we can see irreversibility here. There is some direction, some irreversibility. Uh, this is a bit difficult because if you look at the time reverse signal, it looks very similar to the real one. This is the real experiment, and the other one is I'm taking and flipping the arrow of time. Yeah. I'm trying to see if there are differences. And so yeah, I. Oh, well, okay. If there is no difference, no, it is uh, uh, dissipated. Yeah, in thermodynamics, we will say, for example, you have a sin uh, sinusoidal signal, the reverse is the same. So okay, this is totally irreversible, and I cannot see, cannot predict dissipation. Dissipation is associated with irreversibility. And when you see the signal, you see they are quite similar. It's hard, so you have to fine tune and do a very fine physical analysis. It took us several years, but uh, we found a way. And I'm really not going to, to give the algorithm, but it's related to pullback liner divergence. We have a course in the second week. So um, we compared, so we designed an algorithm that quantifies how irreversible is a signal. And we compared different, uh, okay, these are different cells. It's not our Manfred, but these are, this is just name for friends, but these are different. Uh, if we look at 182 cells, 182 different ones, this, and compared to equilibrium fluctuation. So you can have a, a negative control where you have a double well and a particle jumping in equilibrium. This you can do in the computer tomorrow if you want. It's very simple. So you will have a signal going like this up and down, up and down. Okay, quite similar to this, but we expect they're going to be different. Okay. It's not that the bullfrogs will have a double well. This could come from a different potential. Typically, the models do not use the double well, they use something else. But I would like to compare equilibrium with this one, with this algorithm. And this algorithm showed that this cool liner or measure of irreversibility, when you take longer and longer information or longer and longer parts of the time series, it goes to zero. And here there is a zero in the equilibrium case. And in the bullfrogs, it goes saturates to a value that is positive. So you can really see irreversibility, even if you don't perturb with an external force system. Not only that, it's not only just no, Equilibrium and equilibrium, but also you can quantify. So some of them are more far from equilibrium than others. So these tools in non equilibrium are useful not only to say respond to a binary question, but to quantify. And uh, yeah, and over the last year, there's been a I mean, big challenge of the uh, research program on, on, on estimating the energy dissipation. At the beginning, we had this simple algorithm. It tells us, okay, we are out of equilibrium, but very, very little compared to the real heat dissipation, which we can estimate from models. But now, when you have more than one variable, so now we are looking at just the tip, but what if you can also see the current, the, the, the transduction current generated by the hair bundle? Then you have two variables. Instead of looking at signal in one dimension, it's a signal in two dimensions, where you can see like cycles. This cycle is much more easy to see than this one. I'm being very brief, but when you have two variables, you capture much more in the reproduction of mass As I said, I'm being very brief, but I'm just, just to say that uh, the reproduction heat is a, a concept that we can report to, to biology and, and it has useful information. So we are trying to, to, to go into this topic in, in different systems. Okay, and this was it by now. Uh, of course, if you have questions, we can discuss more. Thanks for your attention. I don't know how to say this. But, um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yes, uh, thanks a lot. And yeah, I hope we can discuss in more detail about any of this stuff. Okay, I have one information. I was doing your talk with you, right? And I was asking if the hands consumption and everybody are lighting is the same as that Okay. Uh, are we and doing hands on session? Ah, it's now? Uh, after the break. Okay. But yeah. uh, let's make the break brief while we both all have yeah. to use the game. Maybe I can reply. Uh,
Force is relevant, yes, and the, yes, it's relevant as far as you know. Yes. Um, typically, the models are overdone, overdone dynamics, but fixed. We are a bit out of time. That's it. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.